Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice today on the show, Alan. Rick Emmett. <laughs> Jeez, this is like a dream come true here. I know it's a metal show, but I'm going to give you jazz hands. You, you know, Rick, I was just watching this news report from 1981, 82 on Much Music, and they and you're playing soccer with Steve Harris of Iron Maiden, and oh, they it and, was amazing. And, and they introduced you as, and here's Rick Emmett from the heavy metal band Triumph. <laughs> yeah, well, the the truth of of Triumph is that um, I think the other guys, especially Gil, the drummer, I think he would have preferred that it be a metal band. Uh, and Mike was, you know, kind of happy to go along on that journey. And when they first initially um, envisioned the band, when I, before I was even in it, I think they sort of saw it as, well, this is going to be like, you know, a, a Jimi Hendrix, Cream kind of thing. So, and I've seen Clapton in interviews talk about how he thinks Cream was maybe one of the first, you know, heavy metal kind of bands, mm -hmm. which, you know, I dispute that. I mean, I sort of think of the, the beginnings of heavy metal and the, when the term was getting thrown around, it was Deep Purple and Black Sabbath to me. You know, yeah. that's where it really started. And to me, Deep Purple was one of the formative. When I joined Triumph, that was one of my favorite bands. And we used to actually do, as a bar band in the early days, a, a little medley of Deep Purple material. And of course, Zeppelin, we were a huge Zeppelin copy band. So that was where the band started, and that's where those guys, you know, uh, that's where they envisioned it. But, you know, I did have more progressive kind of bones in my body, and the band would, you know, plus I was also a bit of a, you know, I would write a tune, and I would hope that it might cross over to AM radio, and there's enough. Heavy metal never did that. <laughs> <laughs> Journey did that. You know, yeah, Sticks yeah. did that. You know, there were a lot of those kinds of bands in the, in the out of the seventies and into the eighties that were making that transition. Um, but yeah, I think the other guys sort of saw it as a metal. So metal one of the metal. reasons why we're having this interview today is the good segue. By the way, it's a great segue. Re-release of all these solo albums, and I'm proud to say on July thirteenth, nineteen ninety eight. The launch of Rick Emmett's solo career, opening for Kim Mitchell. I was able to see you here in Montreal back in 1998 on your Absolutely uh, tour with a yeah. saxophone player. With a saxophone player. Yeah, Colleen Allen played saxophone and uh, Chris Brockway on bass, Sil Simone on guitar, Dave Kachuk on keyboard. It was a big band, six guys. Randy Cook on drums, fantastic drummer. And he's gone on to, he lives in LA now. and you know goes out on tours with all kinds of people and plays on all kinds of records and randy was a tremendous drummer that yeah that was fun that we called that the sneak preview tour i don't know if you got your year right what year were you saying i said 1998 i have it down oh geez no buddy 80, 80, oh, sorry, 88 80, 80, 80, 80, i'm sorry 80. you're, you're tra yeah, sorry transposing numbers i do it in my old age all the time <laughs> Yeah. No, 88, the uh, opening yeah. for Kim Mitchell and, the, yeah. like, you know, getting, it's almost as if you wanted to downsize, right? You did the arena rock thing for years. You even got, like you said, brought in a saxophone player and you, you were really doing your own thing at that time with, with some great radio airplay at that time as well. So, Yeah, like when I left the band, obviously I wanted, you know, the reason I left the band was because I wanted to do things that I couldn't do in the Triumph situation. You know, I mean, it's not like Triumph was going to, if I said to the other guys, hey, let's get a female sax player. She can sing harmonies and she will, we'll get sax lines all over the material. And we go, what are you, nuts? You know, that's, <laughs> no, we're not doing that. Um, but, of course, there was also pressure from managers and, and agents and, and even the record company at the time saying, well, you don't want to get too far away from that. You know, I mean, on the cover of that Absolutely album, which followed on that Kim Mitchell tour. You know, black leather. Yeah, there we go. Black leather, leather jacket, coat. black lust ball. Like that so, sort of says, "Hey, there's a hard rock guy." Yeah, there smiley. You go. Yeah, yeah. A happy-go-lucky heavy metal rocker. <laughs> <laughs> 
But I mean, the first three albums, I remember being in an elevator in London, Ontario, and, and out of the blue off of Ipso Facto, it comes on over the, the, the loudspeaker. So uh, those three albums, I found they were easier to find. You got promos. And then it kind of, with this collection, it, it was more difficult to find as, as a and, fan. And, and we should set this up, Alan. Round yeah, yeah. Hill Records to reissue 11 Rick Emmett you know, solo Emmett. titles. And this was, like you said, July 10th. And I guess... Will these be available on vinyl? Are they only digital? And will they be on CD, Rick? Uh, they're originally, you know, to coincide with my birthday, it was all a digital thing. It was like, um, see, and this answers some of Alan's question too a little bit. When I, after those three f records, I started making them on my own, I became an indie kind of guy. And I would make the records and I would put them up for sale on my website. I would manufacture CDs uh, that I would sell off the stage or do mail order for or whatever, get somebody to do mail order for me. And um, there wasn't digital downloads yet. You know, I think Napster kind of came around 90, ooh, and Napster in 98, there. 98 maybe. Anyway, before, so yeah. when, when the whole thing of file sharing and downloading started, um, I never really pursued it. Like. Uh, and I wasn't really, to be perfectly frank, I was never all that concerned about trying to retail records and turn myself into a record company kind of a person. I was still just a musician. I'd write, I'd record, I'd, I'd put out these records. If I made my money back, I'd go, oh, great. Okay, let's do another, <laughs> you know, like, um, and, I, and those records, I was all over the map. Like, you know, you fellas are, you know, clearly in your heavy metal niche. Yeah. I was doing stuff like, uh, you know, jazz, arch top stuff, classical guitar, blues. You know, I was fulfilling all of the things that, that had been frustrated dreams when I was in Triumph. You know, now I was just going to do whatever I wanted to do. And so it's kind of this lovely thing that, you know, after God knows how many years, you know, a couple of decades, along comes Roundhill. And it started because they were doing the Triumph stuff, right? They put yeah, out yeah, the Triumph, yeah, and they put it out on vinyl. To answer your question, Jimmy, they yep. they put out like the, I think the latest one was the Allied Forces record. Oh no, the classics, the the greatest hits came out on vinyl. Okay. And I think what Roundhill does is they put them out first digitally, so that you know iTunes and Spotify and Pandora and all of these streaming things, shit that I never did. I never pursued any of that. They've said, well, we're going to do that first. And if it goes well, my guess is they'll crank up the machine and say, all right, let's manufacture some vinyl and do that next. You know, like they'll pursue the things that become more expensive things to do, manufacturing up a CD run. And if, if they don't, you know, if they put them out and sort of nothing happens, I go on the metal voice and, <laughs> you know, I do my interviews and they go, well, we didn't sell much after that. <laughs> Well, you know, we're, we're trying we'll try our best yeah, rick you know that's, yeah good for you get out there and beat the bushes gentlemen. you know what it is rick rick people our age buy vinyl and people our age buy cds so they they like physical right we're, I know. we're getting up there in age i know totally i get it and i mean on my own website on my fan forum like that that people will put that's exactly what they post up because they're as old as as we are and they go we're your target market we're your target market you're <laughs> yeah, on the right, right. show all right, so you know, I guess what we'll do is I'll, I'll just leave it up to you. You guys can get back to Roundhill and tell them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you want to do this right. <laughs> <laughs> just to go back to your earlier point, though, I mean, like you said, the valves were open. You were doing anything you wanted, and uh, it, but you never stopped working. It's not one of their where 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 is he now kind of segment. You know, you've never stopped. I think you were one of the earliest guys to embrace the internet and and, and promote yourself through that. Yep. That's off to you on that. And it, it, I mean, there's ton, and here's the proof. Here's the 11 albums being re-released. So, Yeah, you know, um, I, like I think of myself as being very lucky. Like a, I've had a kind of a blessed life that, you know, I didn't have to struggle too hard uh, to kind of keep things going along. And of course, I've never gone through a period where I dried up, where, where I felt like, oh, geez, I, you know, I, I, I can get up every day and, and get my pencil and get my you know, notebook and, and I can write. Like, you know, I, I've just finished a book of poetry, which I think is wow. going to get published. So uh, I've always had a, a creative uh, part of me and uh, been able to indulge it. And, um, you know, somehow the boat floats, 
you know, and so that's good, you know, uh, and now, hey, Roundhill comes along and says, hey, we'd like to make a deal and do this. I go, wow, okay, that's a lovely thing. That's great. Thank you. You know, and again, that's kind of, it's kind of like luck. Now, some people might say, well, it's not luck. You know, you work hard. You, 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 you And I, I, would, I did retire from to, uh, touring uh, a year ago, January. I stopped playing live gigs. So there is that. I did kind of, you know, make a, a, a gesture towards my age and stage going, eh. You know, so, I don't mind playing guitar and I don't mind writing, but man, I don't want to get in the limo and go to the airport and have to get in the plane and go to the, you know, go to baggage and get the thing, and go to the hotel, and you know, like <laughs> that was wearing pretty thin on me. Not even a one-off, maybe a one-off, a special night. It's possible. I and in fact, I did have a couple of little things booked. I was going to do a couple of things where. There's these kind of things now where you can go and and they'll interview you and then you play two or three songs, but somebody talks to you, you know. So it's sort of like doing this show, except you pick up your guitar and sing some tunes. So um, I went, okay, I'll try a couple of those, book those, and I'll I, you know I'll spread them out and I'll try them. And there was one gig where I went, I I played a lot of gigs with Dave Dunlop, who uh, yeah. was my duo guy, and some of the records that you know on that thing there that you got yeah, behind you, Jimmy. They're, yeah, they're, they're Hold on, let me, let me present. Are, let me present yeah. Vanna White. Yes, yeah, so, so, yeah, there One we go. Those. Some of those records are, uh, I was in partnership with Dave Dunlop uh, in playing guitar duo stuff. And there's one record for your uh, hard rock heavy metal fans. There's a record there called Airtime, uh, Liberty Manifesto, which right. I did with a guy named Mike Shotton. And it's really hard rock. It's a very progressive hard rock kind of record. That one in the corner, right by right Jimmy's right ear. There you go. There, there we go. There. Yeah, you like what I'm doing? A real here. hard rock and record. A very modern, very pro. And Dunlop tools. is here, up here. Uh, let me just get it here. Right? Which one? There. Uh, I can't. It's hard to move because it's it's yeah, a new I, image. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. The, are you giving the Troubadours album the finger? What uh, we a thumbs up. A big thumbs oh, up. Okay. I'm I'm really into presentation. I'm really into presentation. <laughs> you're the Vanna White, and he's the Pat Sajak. Is that how respect? <laughs> Something like that. But and you you're know, a guest. It's, it's the uh, these little sessions that you do. I mean, it's the between songs banter that I think everybody really appreciates. I mean, going back to live at uh, Berkeley, you're talking about taking out the garbage when you know Sunday night is garbage night or something yeah. like that. So, uh, yeah, and it, you, know, you know, I mean, Emmett is an Irish name, and so there's probably a lot of Blarney in in <laughs> uh, my you know DNA. But it, when I played gigs and solo gigs. To me, part of the appeal was it was like having a bunch of people in your living room. So I wasn't just going to play and stick to the you know, set list. If somebody said something from the audience and it took me off on a tangent, I mean, when I uh, lectured at the college, the kids would call me Tangent Man. Like that's wow. all they had to do was give me an excuse and off I would go telling a story or an anecdote <laughs> or, you know, like to me, that's that's what life is about. It's, you know, I'm I'm looking to have fun. I'm not necessarily looking to have some sort of dry exchange that's like a, you know, <laughs> professor that, Emmett. you yeah, know what's it, amazing it was, rick rick when I, when I look at all your 11 albums and there there's a few live there too you're looking like from jazz to folk to acoustic to swing right i just i, I put them all on and i've, I've heard them over the years blues. too it, it's just blues i mean country i mean you've done it all i mean people just don't really get what an established or versatile guitar player that you are. It's just, it's incredible. Well, you know, it's lovely of you to say, and, 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 you know, yes, I, you know, but there's another part of me where I go, you know, really all I've ever done is written six or seven tunes and just dressed them up different, yeah. you know, <laughs> given them different styles, you know, different clothes. Um, no, I, I think it's true. And, uh, you know, I've been doing a morning of interviews here. So, you know, forgive me if I seem to be rattling on with shit that I've already said to somebody else. But sure. um, w when I first started, the first good guitar I owned was a nylon string classical guitar. That was the first good one that I ever had. And so the whole idea of fingerstyle, I would go and play Thursday nights at the West End YMCA in Toronto. Uh, they had a coffee house. And I would do James Taylor and Paul Simon and bastardized versions of Roy Clark's Malaguena. Like I, it was kind of acoustic, folky kinds of stuff. And that's who I was. But of course, at the same time, oh, I'm playing in a basement garage band and we're learning Led Zeppelin songs. And hey, Eric Clapton used to play in the Blues Breakers. Let's do a couple of those tunes. I'm learning 
you know, honing my ability to play blues on, on an electric guitar. And that's another voice that's a part of my youth, you know, where I started, you know. So, and then as I got older, you know, along came progressive bands and here came, you know, yes, Steve Howe was a huge role model for me because here's this guy, oh, he plays classical one minute, then he's playing an arch top electric guitar the next, oh, then he's playing slide on a, on a steel guitar. Like he was all over the place. And I loved that. I go, the clap, the clap. clap. Yeah, there you go. And I'm going, that's who I want to be. I want to be that guy. And it was an eclectic kind of approach. If you're in a progressive band, you can fit it all in. In Triumph, eh, it didn't all yeah. fit in exactly, you know. So, but I think well, we, that, we that, that push had, and pull oh, was, go ahead, sorry. Hey, one we, at a time, one at a time. Yeah. <laughs> we always had snippets. I mean, Suitcase Blues, Little Boy that's Blues, what I was say. Uh, yeah. Midsummer Daydreams of the Classic. There's always a serenade in there. And, and that's what was enjoyable for me as a fan. I mean, uh, and again, yeah. and another part of that is the positive lyrics, you know, fight the good fight, never surrender. And that's carried over into your solo career. That's nice to see with songs like State of Grace amongst others. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, well, of course, part of that is, you know, if you're in a band that has decided to call itself Triumph, like, what is that going to mean in terms of, and not just in, in, in terms of, you know, an image that you're going, or a brand that you're going to stick to in, in, in terms of marketing, which, of course, heavy metal bands do that. You know, they, <laughs> they, they, they establish their brand. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, to me, it was a pretty narrow kind of thing. I didn't want to have to stay inside that. But, um, you know, the band was called Triumph before I was even in it. They, they printed up posters and they knew what they were going to do. But it took me until about 1978, 79 to start going, wait a sec. So if it's going to be this, then the songs should be about honesty and truth and, and, and about, uh, you know, like a higher kind of a purpose. And it, like, what is, how does anybody define their own triumph, their own victory? So I started to try and write lyrics and songs about that. And those were the ones that became pretty popular. <laughs> so, you know, then it was like, okay, like when we played the US Festival in 83, yeah. you know, here's all these guys, they're like it's heavy metal day. So yeah. here's this, this 95 degree weather and they're wearing leather and studs, you know, and, and we're the band in white and I'm wearing like a track top, you know, cause it's hot. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to, and my pants are white, you know, and, uh, Brian Adams used to, he, you know, I saw him once do an interview. He, he opened for millions of bands when he was first starting. He was, you know, wherever he could get a gig. But he would always wear an oversized white shirt. And he said, the reason was because uh, when you're on a stage and you don't get all the lights, if you want people to see you, if you're wearing white, it's, it's a, it'll pick up whatever light exists. And at least people will still see you. And when we started to Triumph, I said, guys, we should be wearing white. Because then when the lights go red, we'll be red. When the lights go blue, we'll be yeah. blue. Like, we're white. So we were the band in white, and we were the only band in, you know, reasonable clothing on the day of the yeah, yeah. No kimonos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, to me, it was the, a Jewish priest was the ones. They, they, they had Harleys, and they rode up onto the stage on Harleys, and then they got up, and they're wearing like leather pants and studded things and poor, <laughs> you know, Rob Halford and Glenn Tipton, those guys were sweating like pigs about two <laughs> minutes in. And I'm going, Oh boy, I'm glad I'm not having to wear all that stuff. But, 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 but Rick, okay. So, you know, in every, and like Alan mentioned in every triumph song, there was a bit of you, you know, be it the positive lyrical messages or sort of the, classical influence or whatever it is you put yourself in there looking back now are you saying you know what man we really because of the pushing and pulling of all of us we really created some great music i mean how, how do you yeah, feel I, now you know, when you look back i think it's true that the band reflected you know the personalities and the character of of the of the three of us and um you know it's it's kind of like Sometimes the things that make a band good and unique are also the kinds of things that create stress and tension inside the band. They're eventually going to maybe be the things that break the band up. You know, uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney would be the supreme example, you know, but I mean, even like Hanley and, and Fry and the Eagles, you know, like the, the, if there's talent and there's ambition and there's creativity that's at work there personally, you get to a certain point. And when you start a band, you got nothing. So you're willing to make any sacrifice, but you know, after a, more than a decade, 
if it, there's been success, well, now there's money and there's power and everybody's getting older and people are getting married and they got kids and you know, now your priorities change, you know, and you become, uh, it's, you become more selfish. It's, it's a kind of a hard word to use because it doesn't seem like selfishness. It just seems like in the way, in a way, self-preservation. You're just trying to be true to yourself instead of true to this collective thing that is already a, a, a dated idea. That's from 10 years ago. That's not from now. Now is, so, you know, I mean, it was inevitable that uh, I was going to move on to my own things. But now, yes, as you say, looking back, you go, oh, we did, we did some things that were, you know, we had some originality. We had some, um, some stuff that was true to who we were. And to Mike and Gil's credit in the band, they would say, okay, Rick, you know, here's enough rope, go hang yourself. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> they would give me the freedom to do those things that you mentioned, like Suitcase Blues on Just a Game to me oh. was one of the best moments of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I look back on it now, it was a pivotal thing in my life to have that song on that record, you know, yeah. along with a classical guitar piece, which was like, how many people could say, yep, got a classical guitar piece on a record that's when it went platinum. How many yeah, classical yeah, guitar yeah, players yeah, can yeah, say yeah, that? They, that's right. You, know, you can't. So. I've, that's right. And I, I, Rick, I think you're being extremely humble. I mean, I've said for years, you're the most versatile guitarist that ever this country's ever produced. Uh, uh, you can play anything. And here's the proof with these uh, release of these solo albums. Uh, everybody should be checking them out. So, Rick, you've uh, played every chord. I had the tabs for Allied Forces. And I think every <laughs> single chord known to guitarist and man, you've actually tackled, basically. Could, I'll, Hey, that's a good uh, Jimmy. I'll tell you a story. Ian Thomas is a good friend of mine. He's a singer songwriter, Canadian singer songwriter, and uh, he was over for for dinner just the other day. It was his birthday, and um, I, I would do these. Uh, I was on the board of the Songwriters Association with Ian, and we would every year there'd be the annual general meeting, and then there would be this you know bottle of wine would come out after, and everybody sit around there and have a guitar pull, which is a sort of a traditional folk thing. That, you know, everybody gets out their acoustic guitars and everybody takes a turn entertaining everybody else. So it would become my turn. And Ian would say, hey, Rick, play one of those tunes there where you, you play all of, all them chords. Play, play one of those tunes with all those chords in them. And so I would play, you know, Mr. Bebop or, you know, Beacon Street Hotel or, you know, something that's just full of, of jazz chord changes. And I'd get to the end and Ian would say, oh, Jesus Christ, Emmett. You play more chords in that song than I've known in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one song. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Anybody who's a guitar enthusiast. All right. Before we run out of time, what about upcoming the, documentary, Alan. Yeah. Yep. Upcoming yeah. documentary, Triumph. This is um by Banger, a great a great you know production team, a Canadian as well, right? I mean, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about the documentary? Looking back, I mean, are there moments you're saying, man, oh, man, I can't believe that. I mean, are there any, what are the pros and cons of this whole documentary? That well, this well you know, yeah, it's, it's weird. There's a surreal nature to having somebody, and Banger, they're very good at what they do, and they've yeah. done so many, you know, everybody from Iron Maiden and yeah. Metallica Rush. and Rush, you know, to they've got one that's on Netflix right now. It's a ZZ Top one, like, it, like these guys are consummate pros and they know what they're doing when they're telling a story. And so that somebody's digging around in your life, you know, they come to my house and do, they do an interview and then they come back a few months later and do another one. And then they come back another couple of weeks later and do another one because they're building, they're going deep. Right. And you're going, uh Oh, this <laughs> a little too deep there. <laughs> yeah. Like, like what are they going to find? You know, uh, I'm a little bit concerned. Um, but, uh, it, it, it's it, there's a surreal nature to it that you're going back in your life and they're reminding you of things that you've completely forgotten and you're going oh yeah you know and then they're digging deep and they're going so when the band broke up and you're going okay this hurts actually you know <laughs> i don't want to have to go back to that because you know the rise and the fall and the rise again you know like it's the fall that hurts i don't want to go there <laughs> but you know uh i thought i'd put all this behind me and you know it was ugly heavy baggage and uh but I'm not saying that the the documentary, I've seen a rough cut and they did a, a really extraordinary thing. Uh, I hope I'm not giving too much away here. They, they, it's all right, just between us. Yeah, they flew in fans from all over the world. Yes, they they yes. created an event and uh, 
did, and the fans didn't know that we were going to actually play three songs. Oh, oh wow. So they, they brought them all to the warehouses and they're walking around. And they're looking at this sort of Triumph Museum-y kind of thing. There's, they've got dummies with, with my old spandex jumpsuits on yeah. them. So, you know, chicks are taking pictures of the, the, the dummy's ass, you know. <laughs> that kind of shit is going on. So, and, and then they sit them down and they're going to show them a few little clips, you know, um, on, a, on a scrim. The scrim drops and we start, there we are and we play. Wow. And the, the rush of, of these, and these are the people that love us the most. There's only a couple of hundred of them, but it's just, it was so intense. It was so amazing, you know. And of course, they've got like, you know, 15 cameras around the room capturing every angle of this. Oh, yeah. And then you go, oh my God, like this is heavy duty, you know. So, um it's really good. It really gets to the heart of you're a band, you create some music, you make a connection to people. And then here's these people, they, you're the soundtrack of their lives and it matters to them, you know? Yeah. So they love you. I could get up there and fart and they would go, yeah. <laughs> Greatest fart ever. <laughs> Great. Yeah. I can yeah. smell it from the back row. I love it. <laughs> I, I, I hate to uh, you know, Rick, I'm going to tell you right now from all my friends or people that I know that had documentaries on Netflix and so on, this is going to create another legacy of the band. It'll, it'll create layers and layers. And it'll, even like the guys in Anvil, like Lips has told us many times, their career for the past 10 years has been riding off of that. Doc and new fans start emerging. Right. Yes. So be prepared. Be prepared for <laughs> lots for of triumph. A lot of demand for triumph. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, you know, I, um, yeah, I mean, I felt when I retired from the road, I felt like I was going to be reinventing myself yet again in my life. And of course, that poster behind you, you know, every time you put out a record, like you're reinventing yourself in a certain way. You're going down a different road, a different path. Yeah, there we go. The Vanna White thing. Like, and that's a very, that's been a very eclectic life for me. Yeah. So to come back to Triumph now in my retirement yeah. and now have it be taking on this size and proportion and, and, uh, uh, weight, you. you know, yeah. Yeah. Then, but you know, I feel like I'm not going to let it necessarily push me too far out of, out of shape, you know, because right. I'm not going to try to recapture anything of who I was to, I, because I've had a life where I will, pretty much put that behind me a long, long time ago, you know. Now, is there a comfortable way to, to be who you are, uh, you know, uh, and still do it? Yes. Like, I went on some of these rock cruise things, right? Played right. on a couple of them. And in particular, my last one that I did, Peter Frampton was one of the headliners. Hey. And Peter, like, I've always loved Frampton, and I've always respected, admired him. And he, he was great. Like, he played great. He sounded great. But he's been struggling with a physical thing where he's now literally had to retire from the road because he just can't do it anymore. Like his bones are getting soft and it's not going to kill him, but it means that he can't really tour and play anymore. But he's got such a great attitude about it all. You know, he's being who he really is. Of course, Peter Frampton, you know, the golden locks, the, 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 the poster boy of that whole era, you know, Frampton comes alive. Right? He was the guy that was this cute, blonde guy now i understand a little bit of that because i was on mtv with the blonde locks and you know <laughs> that's been a part of my life but um now you know he's kind of a bald skinny little dude but he plays his ass off when he plays you know and i go okay that's pretty good and, and since i'm on this topic i'm going to mention one other thing because jimmy you, you talked about blues go you know bb king he, he, he'd eventually get to the point where he's way overweight he's got diabetes you know but every night, man, they're walking him out. He's sitting on a chair in the middle of the stage, but he's still bringing it because he's BB. And this is what BB does is he plays the blues, you know? And I always went, okay, I, I think I can still do that. I can figure out a way to do that, you know? Yeah. Sit on a chair and, and play the blues. Like, if that's what it comes to, I, I'll give it a shot, you know? We can segue right into the bonfire sessions there. Maybe that's, uh, that, that's a great feeling, right? Sitting around songs, just sitting around a bonfire. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in a way, um, uh, again, th this, going back to my uh, original roots and the whole folky thing, you know, that was a, I can remember being in high school and we'd go to Wasega beach and we'd, 
you know, build a fire and then I'd get out an acoustic guitar and all my classmates would be sitting around and we'd be singing, you know, Paul Simon songs or whatever, you know. Um, and so I had reached this point where I'm thinking, maybe I'm not going to make any more records. Maybe this will be the, maybe this will be it. You know, so my studio in the basement, I bought a couple of really good mics and I go, okay, I'm not going to add any overdubs. No, no, just guitar and voice. That's it. And then, you know, I had this pile of stuff and I'm going, okay, well, maybe just a Fender Telecaster and a little <laughs> lunch pail amp, you know, maybe for the jazz stuff. I'll just, just, uh, you know, so I, it, it reminds me of uh, Steve Martin in that, the movie, The Jerk, when he's leading those, he goes, and me, and I don't need anything. Well, maybe I just need this phase. I just need this, and then maybe I'll just take this, this picture. That's all I need. Just this, no one and this thing. I need this thing. So anyhow. You know, I, I get to the end of the process and, and, you know, there's 24 songs, 18 of them are like folky thingies, three or four of those are kind of jazzy things. And then there's six finger style guitar pieces. Could I keep doing this for the rest of my life? I think I could. Do I want to? Well, what? that's not where the muse led me in the last little bit. When the COVID thing struck, I, I sat down and I wrote a book of poetry, you know, and there was a real... And, you know, here I am on a heavy metal show. I'm talking about poetry. No, no, don't worry. We, we're flexible. We're flexible. Yeah. yeah, like poetry is like, you know, absolutely one of the worst selling of all books you could possibly put out, you know. And every publisher will tell you this, you know, like, like we don't sell a lot of this shit, you know. They go, yeah, it's fine. You know, it is what it is. And, you know, um, but when the creative muse leads you to something and that's what you do, then it feels right and legitimate. Whereas and I've said this in other interviews, sometimes in the music business, you feel like you're trying to bang a, a, a square peg into a round hole, you know? And I've said, you know, I'm 67 years old now. I'm really only looking for round pegs and round holes. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm not going to try and force anything, you know? It's just a game, Rick. It's just a game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's summarize all this. All right. Oh, yeah. 11 albums being re solo albums. And you know what, this documentary will probably help those solo albums, right, in the process. 11 solo albums. Round Hill Every music. flavor you could even think of. Uh, to be are actually already released July, that were released on your birthday, July the 10th. We're not too far away. My birthday is July 21st. So there you go. We're almost the same Why time. Why not? Just, so you're a cancer as well. I am. Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, and I just I'm forgot my train of thought. I any of that stuff. But. <laughs> All right, Triumph is going to be re-releasing their classic albums on vinyl, right? That's another big thing. Or just the just the the classic. All the it was classic called classics. Yes, it was the right. greatest hits package, and it that's just right. came out on vinyl. Yes. All right. Uh, upcoming documentary to be determined in terms of a date. Is it done? Uh, I would think they're pretty close. I've seen the second rough cut, and I know that they were targeting September, which would have been the Toronto International Film Festival, Ooh, yes. what which. You know, who knows what COVID's going to do to that and to those plans. But their goal all along was a fall release. So who okay. knows what will happen. Maybe it'll just show up on Netflix or something. And the band it has been honored with the Legends of Live Award, which recognizes great contributors to the Canadian music industry, right? You, yes. You have to because wear a suit, a tie, and you got honored. Well, we, we didn't have to dress up too much for that. We, we did have to dress up for the, did the uh, we got the Walk of Fame, the Canadian Walk yes, of Fame right. yes, yes. Like in, in November. And that one was, you had to dress up and you really had to behave yourself. And, you know, um, that was a lot formal. The Legends of Live was more, you know, they had Canadian Music Week and we could dress informally. And, you know, I, I didn't have to write a speech that I had to read off a teleprompter. I just had to go, hey, yeah, thanks a lot for this piece of plexiglass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, oh, any unreleased Triumph material might be resurfacing or anything like that? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, like, I don't know. I know that a Banger dug around, and they found outtakes on old 2-inch uh, 24-track stuff. Lord knows where they found machines to be able to lift that stuff back off of. But when I was looking at a rough cut, I went, isn't that a demo that I did for, you know, a song that never came out? And I go... Oh my God, those guys have really, you know, Dug deep. They, yeah, they've, they've uh, <laughs> swept the cutting room floor. <laughs> Alan, last question. 
Hey, no, I just a uh, complete honor, Rick. I mean, a fan from uh, the eighties, uh, Triumph's one of my top favorite bands. You're one of my top guitarists of all time. And yeah. it's a true pleasure to have you here on the show with us. I, I couldn't be happier. Thank you very much. And, and we don't only do metal. We don't only do metal. <laughs> right on. Prague, rock. Good. The hard rock. We're like Great. you. We're, we're kind of, we, we call it the metal voice. We focus on that, but we kind of, you know. And I, I believe that a lot of the musicians that are in heavy metal bands, they probably would be just as comfortable being in a prog band if yes. they could have found a singer that could have cut it. Yeah. But that became the problem is like, yeah, you know, we can't find somebody that can sing like a chickadee. <laughs> We've only got a guy that can go. <laughs> so, okay, we're going to have a heavy metal because yeah. that's all we can say. Cookie Monster Prague. Okay. <laughs> have yourself a wonderful day. Hey, thanks again, Rick. And thanks, we'll talk guys. soon. Say farewell to the future. Get